First is going to be Pastor Stefan Wismar. He's the executive assistant to the district president. Now, prior to this position, he served as a parish pastor for nine years in Slidell, Louisiana, before becoming the campus pastor and religion teacher for Mayor Lutheran High School, where he served there for nearly a decade, before accepting the call to serve as the executive assistant to the district president. He is an outstanding teacher, theologian, and historian, and he will lead us in the first and the last of our Bible studies and devotions. So please welcome Pastor Stefan Wismar to the podium. Thank you, President Woodford. Good afternoon. Welcome to our convention for our Bible study. Uh, they are in your workbook, so I invite you to turn to page 167 uh, in your workbook, and we will begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Listen to my prayer, O God, do not ignore my plea. Evening, morning, and noon, cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Continue with the hymn. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, the focus of our Bible study as we begin our convention this afternoon is on the name of Jesus. Obviously, the name of Jesus is very significant and central to our life together in Christ as God's people. The name of Jesus, as you think about studying it, can go in a lot of different directions. What we want to focus on is why the name of Jesus is the name above all names, and understanding more who He is under that name, we therefore willingly live under that name and proclaim it so that others too may be brought under the reign of Jesus Christ. 
That theme really does, in its title, right, have two of the most basic claims of Christianity upon the people of this world. The one we're focusing on today, the name of Jesus, is an exclusive claim. And it's why the name of Jesus is so important to understand, to reflect upon, to study, that we can put our faith in it. St. Peter said it the best, perhaps, in Acts chapter 4. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name. The name is important. No other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That is the exclusive claim of Christianity. It's what the world bumps up against all the time and despises. But it is the only name. But Christianity is also not without its inclusive claim because what Jesus does for all people is for all people, hence Everything, everything in the name of Jesus. And on that theme, we'll spend more time at the end of our convention. To begin with our look at the name of Jesus this afternoon, I want to start uh, with a reference point to think through how important and maybe how hard it is to really think this about Jesus. So if you'll open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we'll look at verse 4 and following, right? This is the Shema, uh, the very well-known creed of God's Old Testament people. But let's get it in our minds today regarding this idea of the name. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's a very simple, short, concise confession and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them in the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, every part of your life should never be absent of this name. The other reference point then, starting with that simple confession, is Thomas's confession at the end of the Gospel of John. So if you could turn to John chapter 20, in that significant moment. If you remember, this is the week after Jesus' resurrection. Thomas was not with them, right, when Jesus first appeared, and he doubts the reality, right? Unless I can see it with my own eyes, I, I won't believe. So Jesus shows up and reveals himself to Thomas. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. So the reason for these two texts to, to frame our conversation about the name of Jesus this afternoon is, is to ask that question. How does a pious Jewish boy like Thomas who grew up enmeshed in this Shema, that there's only one God, and his name is Yahweh, or Lord in all capitals. How does he come to the point where he has the guts to say that Jesus of Nazareth is that person there in the flesh? Because if Thomas is wrong, he has betrayed his faith, and he is an idolater. But if Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh, then Thomas has recognized exactly what he should and has put his faith 
in Jesus. So first, let's clear up some words in the Old Testament and how they're used, because I think part of when we talk about the name as it is in the Old Testament, it gets lost to us as English readers if we're not paying attention. So very quickly there in that box, you'll see, right, we really have three words that are most important uh, with respect to the person of God in the Old Testament. We have Elohim, which is translated God most often. It simply refers to the being of God. Then we have Yahweh, the personal name of God, right? A technical term, right? Tetragrammaton, the four letters, so we can sound smart about talking about God and his personal name, right? But in our Old Testaments, in the ESV, the NIV, it, that word is most often translated Lord in all capital letters. So every time you're reading your Bibles, that's the personal name of God, not a title. And it's important not to lose sight of that when we're talking about the name of God. He has a name. It was made up of four letters. We thought it was Jehovah. Now we think it might be Yahweh. But there's this old tradition, right, in the Old Testament. It's so holy we don't say it, right? The Kathib Kare tradition. You have what is written, but when you come across it, this is what you say. So you see the four letters, but you say, Lord. And so we kind of, for some reason, honor that tradition and Lord in all capitals is how we do it. So if you go back to the Shema and look at that real quick, the Lord your God is, is in all capitals because it's not his title. It's the name of God. The name of God is one. Okay. All right. So. The next part of our discussion then, barring an article from Charles Gieschen regarding Yahweh and Jesus, I think is very significant for leading us to that point where Thomas says of Jesus what he would rightly say of only Yahweh. And it happens a lot as Jesus reveals who he is in the Gospel of John, right? The first is to consider how to understand the use of the word word in John as Jesus uses it and refers to it, right? So there in your Bible study, this short quote to make the point, I would invite you to read the article in its entirety if you want kind of the, the background and support for these arguments. Based on the reciprocal relationship between the word and name in the prologue and the prominence of name theology elsewhere in John, the referent of his word in John 5.38 should be interpreted to be his name rather than his communication or his teaching. So it's a simple exercise here, but turn with me to John chapter 5, 37 to 38. And I just want you to listen for it, but I think you'll, you'll recognize how this changes your understanding of it. Because I would bet that many of us, if you've thought about this passage of all, tend to think of his word as teaching and not being connected rather to the divine name as it's being revealed through Jesus. So I'm going to read it once as it is, and then I'm going to replace word with name and just reflect on how that changes the meaning of the text. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. And now again with replacing the word. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his name abiding in you for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. It puts the focus on the person and the object of our faith, not the content of his teaching. And that's a significant difference in understanding. This continues uh, to be true throughout the Gospel of John, right? Jesus' identity as Professor Gieschen points out, is central to the Gospel of John. Who is he? Jesus constantly inviting people to think about who he really is. And again, if we can turn to John 8, 
and do the same thing. John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Again, we tend to sometimes read truth there as a, a set of principles to believe in. But Jesus says elsewhere in John, I am the way, the truth, and the light. He's talking about him, not a set of principles. So if we reread it. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my name, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's a little different, isn't it? The word as glory, similar as well. There is significant interest, Professor Gieschen says, within the Gospel of John in beholding Jesus as the visible image or form of God, the glory of Yahweh seen by Moses at Sinai, by Israel in the tabernacle and temple, and then by the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel in their call and visions. And when John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, right? That's significant. That glory in that sense is always the same as the name. So we could say we have seen his name and his name has dwelt among us right? Because the glory in the Old Testament is the, the Shekinah, the dwelling presence of Yahweh. And now this dwelling presence of Yahweh is not in the cloud in the tabernacle. It is in the flesh of Jesus of Nazareth. So we've got all these significant things so far in John that connect them specifically to the name of Jesus. Now we have these other ways throughout the Gospel of John that I think many of you will be familiar with by which Jesus is inviting you to connect himself not just to the person of the Trinity, but to the divine name itself. We don't have time to look up all these passages, so get your pen ready if you want to fill them in, and we'll, we'll fill them in quick here, right? So John has seven signs. We're familiar with this, right? He doesn't work with the word miracle, signs point. So every one of these demonstrations of power is pointing to something, and I'm contending here this morning that what he's pointing to is that he is Yahweh in the flesh redeeming his people. John 2, water into wine. John 4 is the healing of an official son, and this one by the word only, right? Just go and he will be healed. John 5 is the healing at Bethesda. John 6, the feeding of the 5,000. John 6, walking on water. John 9, healing of a man born blind. And then, of course, most significantly heading into his own passion, John 11 is the raising of Lazarus. All significant miracles that we tend to attach, I think, more often maybe to his work, right? This is revealing what Jesus has ultimately come to do, restore creation and save us. But I would also contend again in our theme of the name that they are also revealing who he is, right? a la Ezekiel, right? I myself will come and shepherd my people, and this he does through Jesus. Then we get the seven I am sayings of Jesus. There are actually two sets. Um, The absolute sayings are probably a little lesser known as a set of seven, but these are sayings in which Jesus doesn't just say sort of in a symbolic sense, like I am the bread of life. He actually is saying, "I, I am. Yahweh, right? So John 4 is the Samaritan woman where Jesus, uh, at the end, right, the Samaritan woman says, the Messiah is coming. He'll tell us, I don't need to talk to you anymore. And Jesus says, I am the one who am talking with you, right? So there's that connection to the name of God and that very important phrase, I am. 
always hearkening back to that revelatory moment at the burning bush with Moses. Then we have John 6, where Jesus is walking on the water, and Jesus says, I am, do not be afraid. John 8, unless you believe I am, you will die in your sins. John 8, 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know I am. John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. John 13, when it does take place, you may believe that I am. In John 18, when Jesus is arrested, and they're looking for him, right? We're looking for Jesus in Nazareth. Jesus steps up and says, I am. Every one of those statements, because Jesus is using I am, is making a connection to the name, right? Back to the Shema, Yahweh is your God. Now the ones you're more familiar with, John 6, bread of life, John 8, light of the world, John 10, 7 and 9, the door, John 10, 11 and 14, the good shepherd, John 11, the resurrection and the life, John 14, the way, the truth and the life, and John 15, the true vine. And again, when Jesus delivers these statements as he's teaching, what does he put in front of every one of those? The divine name. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, and so on. And then finally, the connection of the name to worship as Jesus has this discussion in the Gospel of John. In John 4, we have the woman at the well, right? And, and again, she engages Jesus in this conversation. You Jews say we need to worship on in Jerusalem. We worship on this mountain. And Jesus says true worshipers uh, are the ones who worship in spirit and truth with the Father as the object. And again, she says the Messiah will tell us. Jesus says, I am he. So this advent of worship in spirit and truth all comes through the name of Jesus. John 9, also a significant moment of worship with the name. This is the whole chapter of the man born blind. And while the religious leaders are chastising this man for his miracle and calling him an unbeliever and all sorts of other nasty nonsense, he finds Jesus. And Jesus says, have you heard of the Messiah? He says, I don't know who he is. Tell me who he is. And Jesus says, I am. And what does he say? Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. So before Thomas gets to this point in his faith, this blind man has it figured out. Jesus is his God in the flesh, and he has given him sight. The point of all of this work in John is so that we see that in all these ways in the Gospel of John, Jesus is constantly pointing to the fact that his name is not disconnected from God's personal name in the Old Testament. The name is in, with, and under, to use that phrase, the name Jesus. And this is what Thomas finally recognizes, and so he confesses, my Lord and my God. And this is why Jesus ultimately becomes the name above all names. Now, a little work for you. So 
Just using the first two chapters of Colossians, the text of Colossians is printed in front of the Bible study. So if you've printed it, of course, I did that so you can mark it up. But if not, however you need to mark it up. But I'd like you to to quickly skim through chapters 1 and 2 in Colossians and highlight the references that give an answer to why we would also say and do everything in the name of Jesus now with an understanding of everything that that name constitutes. So go ahead, take a few minutes uh, to do that. All right, there's quite a bit there. And hopefully you've gotten a few verses because now I'm going to add to your task. I want you to take those verses that you've highlighted and discovered. And this is uh, question four now. Now I want you to take those verses you jotted down uh, in chapters one or two and look for the ones that explain or give a reason or a connection to ascribing to Jesus the being of God or the personal name Yahweh or the title of Lord. And there may be some overlap there, right? But if Jesus is connected to Yahweh, we shouldn't just see associations with it God's personal name, but also to the being and the title as well. So draw out those connections from these initial verses you highlighted. So an example of of one to suggest would be Colossians 1.15, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If Jesus is God, we should do everything in his name, right? That, That may be stands to pretty simple reason, but it also very directly what connects the name of Jesus in this very important thing that Jesus is God, right? In his being, right? He is God. Um, So that was the the kind of connections we're looking for. So I invite you, I'm just going to give you about a minute, but uh, Pastor King really wanted me to do this. So uh, if you would partner up and uh, just share with each other one of the connections you made real quick, uh, and then we'll we'll move on to the next section of the study. All right. Thank you for your work uh, on that part of the book. Now I want to move the discussion in a little bit different direction in terms of we think about the name of Jesus in, in kind of in print. This is just kind of an, an interesting fact here. Uh, so in preparing for this, right, I read this book that you have there on, on page 170, some quotes from that we're going to review a couple of points from. But I, I personally always hated the tradition that in our English Bibles we maintain this kind of Old Testament thing where we we don't want to print the personal name of God on the page and we want to, you know, keep doing this kind of Jewish tradition where we don't want to say the name. But we can say the name. So so why do we do that? Uh, So in reading this book and stuff, so I kind of emailed the author and had this nice exchange with him regarding uh, this, and he kind of made me rethink it for the first time. And I'm not sure I'm totally persuaded yet, but his point was, it's following a significant tradition, not only in Old Testament manuscript transmission, but also in New Testament manuscript transmission. And what visibly doing to that word says about the sacredness of, of that name. And that made me think a little differently about that. And so maybe the effort isn't to just translate it the way it is, but to teach it, you know, so people know that when they're reading it, that, that thing. So, so here's what it is. If you haven't heard this before, right, this idea of these, uh, the sacred name in the Old Testament, but then also these, they call them nomina sacra or sacred names in the New Testament. So I already mentioned, right, that you had the Kathib Karay tradition of, of the Old Testament, right? So you come across what is written, but you say this instead. But it was also done visually in the manuscripts, right? And this is what this author brings out, that scribes used a wide variety of techniques. Sometimes they would use archaic Hebrew letters, right? So everything else would be in the newer Hebrew script, but when you'd get to the the name of Yahweh, it was written in the older style script. So it stood out visually as a unique, holy, and sacred word in the text of Scripture. Sometimes they would just put four dots or four slashes, 
And that was probably even done intentionally so you couldn't accidentally say it because you don't even have any letters there to pronounce. But the point is they were doing this visual cue in the text that made the confession of faith in what we believed about that name stand out separate. And so the author says, right, that this was visible expression to a basic tenet of the Jewish faith. And by doing it this way, he said it underscored the uniqueness and oneness of God's name and therefore also the uniqueness and oneness of, of God himself. He also brings up then in the Greek translation, right, in the Septuagint, the name of Yahweh is still in Hebrew letters. They didn't translate it into Greek or transliterate it into Greek right? So that you would see it. It would stand out. Now, the most significant controversies in the early church were really around who? Jesus and who he is, right? Look at our creeds. There's a reason the second article is the longest. It's because it was the, the person of the Trinity where all the controversy was. And so you need more and more explanations to make it clear to everybody what the one true confession of faith regarding Jesus is, right? So you got all these confessions of faith, and mostly it was around the person of Jesus, not so much his work, and the issue of, is he really God or not, right? The divinity of Christ was a often wrestled with and called into question doctrine of, of the early church. So it's interesting, I think, then, as the manuscript tradition of the New Testament develops, they develop a similar idea, perhaps borrowing from this Old Testament tradition, right? They began to do visually in the text certain things with only certain names that they would stand out as very distinct. And those four words, Lord, God, Jesus, and Christ. And he says here, right, in virtually all extent Christian copies of the scriptures, this practice is done. And I think he says, you know, at the end of the quote there at the bottom of page 70, right, as has rightly been pointed out, these earliest four words are not merely nomina sacra, but nomina divina, right? These are divine names. And we can say that because you only do this with the divine name. So as you come into the New Testament, right, if you're going to do this with these other words, what are you saying about Jesus? Because in the New Testament, these other words, Lord, God, and Christ, are always in close proximity to the name Jesus. And so if you're going to write all of those words in a special way, it is a visible cue to the reader, to the Christian, that Jesus is God. He's connected to the God who has revealed himself as Yahweh in the Old Testament and enfleshed in Jesus Christ. So if you turn uh, to page 171, you'll see an example of that from Codex Sinaiticus, as best as I could reproduce it. And the way they did this is they would shrink the name to two letters and then put a line over the top of it. So uh, in the reproduction, the line is barely visible, but it's also barely visible in Sinaiticus. Um, but this is uh, the part of Corinthians, right? Uh, Kyrios, Jesus, Christos, right? So Lord Jesus Christ. And by doing that and in, in representing the name in this way, the guys who are copying this manuscripts are telling you their firm belief in conviction like that of the blind man who said, I believe and worship Jesus and like Thomas, my Lord and my God, they are telling you that they believe Jesus is God. Okay? Now, if you go back then, so I did some other checking in Sinaiticus. If you chose in your brief mining of Colossians 1 and 2, Colossians 1.10 or 2.6 or 1.3, right, in those places, 
they're all nomina sacra, right? Lord Jesus Christ in 1-3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is shrunk, line over the top. And so again, it's always a little difficult in the New Testament, but in general, right, Lord, you always kind of have to have with it the connection to the divine name, not just title, right? And the fact that they sort of turned it into a nomen sacra always implies that as, as well, right? So you would have connections there to the divine name, not just the title, okay? Um, but it speaks very clearly to the reality of who Jesus is and why we worship him, right? If he is not God, we should not be doing this, this business that we're in. But we believe that along with thousands of others before us, okay? So that's really the, the first part of our, our study here, and we have to get booking. But that was our, our look at Jesus' person, who he is, right? What he has done to us. And now we want to ask the question, right, why is he the name above all names? Why do we think he is superior uh, to everyone else? So the best place to answer that question is in the book of Hebrews. And so let's turn there. To Hebrews chapter 3. And there the author says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house, has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So, Jesus is superior to Moses in the briefest way possible because he is God's son and therefore is made of the same stuff as God, right? He is God and is therefore superior. We don't have time to get into to the rest of the Hebrews verses here because I do want to get into the, the next section. But Hebrews 4 right, talks about superior to the high priest because Jesus is able to sympathize, was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Uh, and again, that priest in the order of Melchizedek, which is a whole Bible study unto itself. Um, and then uh, Hebrews 9, Jesus' sacrifice is superior because it was once and for all, for the sins of all humanity, for all time. And Revelation 5, uh, as Jesus takes his place at the right hand of God in that great throne room vision, right? Who alone is worthy to open the scroll and is worthy of praise? Only Jesus, the lamb who was slain. So when, where, and how to proclaim the name of Jesus? I'd like to spend just a little time and have you discuss this. Merely having an open mind is nothing. The object of opening the mind as of opening the mouth is to shut it again on something solid. It's a Chesterton quote. And uh, I, I think it's good because that's often uh, people that think Christians are a bunch of closed-minded bigots. The first thing they want you to do is take your mouth off of that thing solid, right, and open your mind. That's the first trick. So... Discuss again in your small groups, keeping in mind the Chesterton quote. What would you share with someone who said to you in a discussion over a controversial issue regarding the faith and practice, you just need to have an open mind? What do you say? Go ahead. All right. Let's pull it back together up here, and we're getting close to time. So we're going to end with this question. Because I think, again, that open mind, when you get approached with that statement, right, you need to keep an open mind, that usually means you're engaging in debate with somebody who, who probably doesn't know Jesus, right? And they're pushing back as hard as you're pushing them to want to hear what you have to say. And that means you're in a good discussion. But this is the world we're in. It's hostile. 
to what we believe, teach, and confess. It does not want to hear it, and it is quite put out when you try. And in Colossians, this is exactly what Paul, a congregation he's never met, a congregation he did not start, is worried about and concerned for. They haven't given in, but they're under pressure. And we most certainly are under pressure. And so Paul highlights a few things, starting at Colossians 2.8, getting into the first part of chapter 3, right? And he says, I don't get captive by philosophy and empty deceit and human traditions according to the elemental spirits, not according to Christ. And there you have that exceptional claim of Christianity again. Paul makes it a very clear divide. There isn't schmoozing over to the world and still saying, I believe and worship the name of Jesus. You follow Christ, it is opposed. But the people that oppose you also need the love of Jesus. And that's part of the wrestling match. The key, I think, is throughout this whole section of Colossians here, from 2.8 through the first early verses of chapter 3, the response of all of these challenges from Paul is clearly and set squarely on the shoulders of our living Lord Jesus Christ. And he does it in probably the most profound way in chapter 2, verse 9. For in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Jesus, who is the head of all rule and authority. Again, you hate to say he's making it too easy here, but right? But if this is true of Jesus, why are you even messing around with the other stuff, right? This is the greatness and superiority of Jesus for us who call us his disciples. The other place that I think this is neat is also how you see the person and work of Jesus getting into the conversation in a very clear way. There's two uh, conditional clauses here in one, or sorry, 220 and 3 1. You have some very big if statements here, and they're connected most simply to how we would describe the work of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits, then this, because this is what it means to follow the name of Jesus who died for you. And 3.1, if you have been raised with Christ, this is what it means to live with him. So if you died with Christ, death means gone, then you put away this stuff and it doesn't bother you anymore. And if you've been raised with Christ, it pushes you onward, upward into new life, new life under the name of Jesus Christ. And there we are out of time, and we'll just conclude with the rest of our liturgy. There is my buzzer. Let us continue. O Lord, O Christ, O Lord, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Most merciful God, you desire everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Grant that by the preaching of your gospel, we may be given the wisdom that leads to salvation. By the working of your Holy Spirit, keep us attentive to all the teachings of your word, enlighten our minds, control our wills, and purify our affections. Let your word be a light for our path, that neither the pleasures, nor the honors, nor the pains of this life may turn away our thoughts for the fullness of life that is found only in you. Enable us in sincerity of heart to follow you, the only true God. By your holy word, enlighten all who are in error, doubt, or temptation with the sure and certain knowledge of your truth, that all who live in sin may be led to repentance. Show mercy and grace to all those suffering any distress, to those who are sick or hospitalized, and to those facing death. Let them know the sure comfort of your holy word. We commit ourselves and all for whom we pray to your fatherly care and benediction. Be gracious to us and defend us by your power. Direct us by your spirit that we may daily grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior 
until we shall stand before you in the joy of everlasting glory. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit of one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in all our afflictions, to defend us from all error, to lead us into all truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us bless the Lord. Thank you.